After paying $150 for a few grams of electroluminescent ink, I decided I needed to find a way to do this at home. So I did. Don't try this at home, it's probably not good for you. I started with acrylic glow paint, the zinc sulfide stuff that glows green. And then I put it in water and I put some dish soap and I repeatedly washed it until I separated all the crystals out to the bottom and then I dried them. Since this was non-standard, a lot of this was just trial and error. I started by dissolving copper sulfate in water. I ground the copper surface off of a penny, a newer penny, to get to the zinc, because we're trying to make zinc sulfate. You can buy zinc sulfate from the store. They use it as a roof demoss agent. This reaction yields copper metal. It's kind of spongy at the bottom and a clear solution of zinc sulfate. I mix that with my zinc sulfide glow powder. I added more copper sulfate. Just a very little bit. The percentages we're talking about in this, this uh, process are a few hundred parts per million. So I dissolved this, the solution turned blue again. Before we put this concoction into the kiln, let's take a moment and look at this not so accurate model of zinc sulfide glow powder and examine why it glows and how we're going to modify it to work in electroluminescent mode. The host material is a cubic lattice of zinc and sulfur atoms. It's doped with copper, which is the luminescent center, which causes it to emit green light. This is an energy diagram of the energy states in the host lattice and the luminance center. Electrons are represented by solid red circles and holes by black circles. Holes can be just thought of as an absence of an electron. The valence band is the energy level where electrons will reside before being excited to the conduction band. Excitation happens in glow powder when UV light strikes the crystal lattice and the electrons absorb enough energy to jump what's called the band gap. The excited electrons and their whole counterparts pull the electrons below the conduction band into the forbidden zone where it's improbable that they'll drop back to the valence band. And these electron hole pair combinations called excitons wander aimlessly through the crystal lattice until they encounter a luminescent center that allows them to drop back down and emit a photon. The band gap between the conduction band and the luminance center determines the wavelength of light emitted. By changing this atom, we can change the color of the phosphor. By adding more of these atoms to the crystal lattice, we can shorten the persistence of the phosphor because the excitons are more likely to run into them. To use this phosphor in electroluminescent mode, we need to make it work more like light emitting diodes. This is an energy diagram for an LED. On the bottom you see a representation of a physical N and P type semiconductor junction. Electrons are being injected on the N side and being swept away on the P. At the junction, electrons drop from the conduction band to the valence band. This is called electron hole recombination. Photons are emitted, determined by the band gap again. I've read dozens, if not hundreds, of papers on electroluminescence, and I was surprised to find out that even after 40, 50 years of having these devices, the people still don't quite understand what's going on inside the, the zinc sulfide crystals, which I think is kind of cool. One popular theory is that if you heat up copper sulfate and zinc sulfide for two hours at 800 degrees C, needle-like copper compounds that are conductive grow between the crystal lattice. If you place these phosphors between the parallel plates of a capacitor and then apply an alternating current, an electric field is formed across the length of these copper needles and electrons are swept back and forth. This is causing electrons to be 
accumulated on one side and holes on the other. When the field's reversed, then the holes are recombined and photons are emitted and the cycle continues. Okay, before we put it into the kiln, we need to protect it from oxygen. So I'm using glass frit. I'm just pouring this on top of the, the copper sulfide. Oh, and I dumped off the excess liquid after I had mixed it up. I set it up in the kiln and set the kiln to 800 degrees for two hours. When I came back, I shined my violet laser on it and it was still glowing green, um, but very short persistence, which was very promising. It seemed to have different stratas of um, persistence in the material. Probably didn't get it mixed very well. And then I crunched the, the vial open. All the glass for it had fused together. And then I picked out the glass chunks. And this is my test structure. And the stack up, it's just made like a capacitor, so the phosphor sandwich between some dielectric layer and a conductive glass. And I'm going to apply some alternating current to it. The voltages um, were pretty high to get this stuff to light up. I'll turn the lights off here and then see what the results are. It's just visible in the daylight, not very bright. After further research, I found that I should have added chlorine atoms to it to make it brighter. That adds to the um, donor acceptor electron hole recombination effect. Thanks for watching.